So, okay, my name is Ron Carrico. It's uh, January the 17th, 2018, and we're at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, and we're interviewing Dave Barnett, one of our um, volunteers here at the museum who flew F 100s. And uh, so, to start off with, where were you, where were you, where were you born? Good. Good morning, Ron. Uh, Dave Barnett, uh, born uh, in Temecula, actually. Uh, I grew up in that area. Uh, Third generation California. No kidding. What did your parents do? Uh, my father worked at a uh, health resort called Marietta Hot Springs, uh, owned by the Gunther family. He worked uh, nearly his whole, whole life there. Uh, so uh, I went to uh, grammar school in, Elsa, or in Temecula and then uh, moved out to Marietta Hot Springs where my dad worked. And uh, it was kind of an eager experience. He started out working in the front office there and then he ended up being the general manager after about 35 years, I think it was there nearly 40 years. So, so it was a neat, neat place to grow up. Where did you, where did you, uh, what, what year were you born? I was born in 1938. So 38, well, you're three years older than I am. Okay, very good. <laughs> so you got into aviation. Why and how? Okay, uh, after grammar school in, El uh, in Temecula, I went to uh, Elsinore High School. It was the only high school in the whole valley at that time. I've changed a lot over the years by now. Uh, and then from there I went up to Fresno State, uh, earned a degree, a bachelor's degree, or actually uh, in industrial engineering. I uh, graduated from Fresno State in 1961. Uh, about that time the Vietnam War was starting to come up and so I decided to interview, I uh, interviewed with both the Navy and the Air Force about what programs they had. Uh, the Air Force had something called Officer Training School, uh, which, in, uh, which I signed up for. Uh, they sent me down to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, after uh, three months down there, I was commissioned a second lieutenant, uh, and uh, that was in September 1961. And during that time, they asked me if I'd like to get in, if I'd, uh, I was qualified physically to uh, be a pilot. I uh, had never flown in my life, uh, but I said, well, that sounds great, so I decided to, to sign up uh, to go to pilot training after officer training school. Which, which base did you go to? Uh, they assigned me to uh, Big Spring, Texas, uh, Webb Air Force Base. It had been a, uh, a navigator training school, I think, during World War II, uh, but then it was converted to one of the primary uh, pilot training bases. Uh, I was fortunate enough to fly both the T-37, a little two-seat side-by-side -side trainer initially, and then the second phase we moved into T-38. And, which was brand new at that time. We were very fortunate. That was the only base at that time that had the T-38, uh, a two-seat tandem uh, trainer, uh, could easily go supersonic and uh, was just a great, uh, a great airplane to learn to fly and a great transition into the F-100. So, uh, what class were you? I was in class 63 Delta. Uh, actually, uh, we we spent more than a year, a little over a year, getting through pilot training because the F1, or excuse me, the T-38 had some uh, fuel control problems shortly after we got it, and so we actually had about six weeks where we didn't fly at all. But once they got those trained out, uh, it, it worked out fine, and uh, so we were actually delayed in gra in graduating a little bit longer than normal. So you selected, you were selected for the F-100, uh, or you were selected for fighters. Do you know why you were selected for fighters as opposed to transports? Well, usually when the mm -hmm. uh, assignments came down from the pilot training class, uh, obviously we had uh, a priority system of how well you did during your pilot training days, and uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to be high enough. They had mostly F-100s and F-105s were the choices at that time, and I selected the F-100 and uh, thoroughly enjoyed my choice. So now you you flew the F-100 your entire career. Right, that was uh, my my airplane to fly. I uh, went to uh, Luke Air Force Base in '63. Uh, I think about uh, there was about uh, seven or eight month course. Learning to fly the F-100, learning to uh, uh, after once learning the basic skills of flying a 100, then learning uh, the gunnery gunnery skills. Uh, it had four uh, 20 meter guns in it, and of course it could drop bombs uh, and uh, rockets and. Uh, also learned air refueling uh, and uh, navigation, uh, low, low altitude navigation, that type of thing. So it was a great so, airplane. So specifically, let's talk about uh, individual things. You, now, transitioning into it, what is it like to fly compared to a T-38? 
Well, the T-38, like I said, uh, was a great uh, preparation for, for going to the 100. Uh, there were a lot of similarities. They could both, uh, the F-100 is known as to be in the first uh, operation airplane that could go supersonic. So uh, we did fly the su go supersonic in the, in the F-100, my first flight or two. But after that, realistically, uh, supersonic flight was not very realistic in, uh, in actual combat situations. So, I don't think we hardly ever went uh, supersonic again, but it was a, an, e an easy transition from the T-38 to the F-100. Did you uh, did you do air-to-air uh, -air combat with the F-100? Yes, we did. Uh, I think uh, later on, and uh, we didn't do much of that actually at Luke, but once I did uh, uh, assigned operational uh, bases both in uh, Homestead, Florida, and later on Lake and Heath, England, uh, we certainly did do quite a bit of. Uh, uh, air to air combat training. Well, let's talk about the let's talk about the ground ground attack because that's probably what F one hundreds are most famous for is the ground attack. I, I think that's very true. Uh, I mean, we did do some air to air training, but uh, the bulk of our training was uh, we would uh, was to learn to shoot the learn to strafe with our twenty millimeter guns, uh, drop bombs, both uh, high angle and low angle bombing, and and shoot rockets. Okay, so, okay, I flew the F-4, so what we did typically was, when you go to the range, we'd do a nuke, or what we usually have, two nuke attacks, one a lay-down type, one and one would be a, uh, a lad maneuver, but I think in the F-100 they did a new, different maneuver. Well, right, we had both of those, we had a, a lay-down, a lad, and then we had an over the, what we call an over-the-shoulder, where you basically flew right over the target, and then you did a loop, and the uh, the weapon came off as you were uh, in your ascent, uh, and then you went back, uh, did an emblem and maneuver at the top, and then flew back uh, to escape. So, uh, shortly, so actually, my training in the F 100 was both for conventional, for shooting, dropping bombs, and shooting the guns, and then also uh, for uh, dropping nuclear weapons, which we did shoot nuclear alert uh, several times during my career. So, so describe for me again the over-the-shoulder. You said, did we pulling up vertically and then releasing the, the weapon? Right. You, you, you basically come right over the target, uh, then you pull up uh, vertically at about a 4G pull, uh, basically just doing a loop, and uh, the system in the aircraft is designed to actually automatically release the weapon at a certain point as you're going up over the shoulder, and then it continues up as you go back over the shoulder and then it would come back down hopefully fairly near where, where your aiming point is. Do you remember what the weapon was? Uh, the Mark 28 is uh, one of the early ones I remember. Uh, I know there were several others after that that we learned and, and did, did uh, uh, carry or set, new, set alert with. I know they went through several iterations uh, during my career flying with the 100. Yeah, yeah we, we used the same thing in the F4. So. But we never did that over the shoulder. We never did that. Huh? No, yeah. no, we yeah. did the lab and we pull a 45. Release it, roll upside down, and pull down. Okay. And then, you know, boogie on down the road as fast as right. you can go. Yeah, so I remember at Wheelis, we would we had a uh, uh, dummy, uh, two thousand pound, two thousand uh, pound dummy that we uh, we practiced with, and when that came off, as you were going over your loop, you could definitely feel <laughs> a pretty good jolt as you yeah. let go of that baby going over the top. Yeah, we, call it, we call it the shape. Remember, it yeah. was blue. Yeah. Uh, so now. So now the next thing you would be practicing, let's see, as I recall, we would go and usually do um, a simulated skip bomb type thing, a napalm. Right, yeah. And I did your, I think our pod held six six bombs. And so we would do two nukes and then two laydowns and then two dive bombs. Um, and usually 45 degree dive is what we did. Yeah, I think uh, if we did both 45 degree and 30 degree dive was I think our normal uh, the dive angles that we practice quite a bit, right? So, what was the? Well, let's just talk about speeds a little bit. What kind of a? If you're on a low-level navigation mission, simulated combat mission, what do you recall what the airspeed was you used? I, I usually ride at 400. I think was pretty much uh, typical of what we try to keep a speed at. Uh, and then run in. And then, uh, if you were doing a bomb run in, uh, I think for over the shoulder, whatever we we try to get up to 500 knots. Uh, that was our normal run in speed for. Uh, uh, weapon, nuclear weapon delivery. And the F4 we used 420 and 540 Did you? from okay. the IP on it. And it would get to 540. Just like, like that. that. Yeah. Unbelievable how fast that thing was. <clears throat> okay, so your first duty assignment then out of Luke was? Uh, Homestead, Florida. Uh, 31st TAC Fighter Wing, uh, assigned to the 306 TAC Fighter Squadron. Uh, that was in 64 when I joined down there. Uh, 
they tried to get me, they wanted to get me uh, combat ready as soon as possible because they were starting to deploy to Turkey. Uh, one of the squadrons, the head of the 308 squadron, actually flew F-100s on a very long deployment uh, uh, from all the way from Florida to Florida uh, to Chile, Turkey, right near Izmir. Uh, and they were there uh, about three months and then the 306 went over and replaced them. It was so, Inselik, Turkey? Right. Uh, not, no, not Inselik. This was Izmir. It was on the western coast of, uh, of, of uh, Turkey. Inselik is another one of the main bases there in Turkey, you know, that, that we had at. Uh, what was, the, what was the living conditions like? Was it an Air Force base or what was it? It was a, basically a Turkish base, but uh, we had uh, Air Force facilities there and uh, they, uh, I think this was an early time when they set up to have, uh, our main purpose over there was to set nuclear alert. We had our four airplanes that we would set nuclear alert on while we were over there and uh, we would also, they had a, a, a bombing range called Konya, I believe it was, that we would actually uh, it was not a controlled range, it was just a, some targets on the ground that we could go drop some bombs on and practice a bit. So that, it was not near as good a training as we had when we went down to Wheelis. That was the other main place that we did most of our training then. Was there, did they have a range officer out there then? Uh, not at Konya, no. It was just, uh, you just uh, controlled yourself when you went out to the range. Okay. But of course at Wheelis, I was a range officer, very well, well controlled. Lot of <coughs> How many times did you go to Wheelis? Oh gee, uh, well I was at Lake and Heath, uh, well when I talk about Wheelis now I got to talk about uh, my so, second, uh, yeah but it's back up chronology a little bit, okay. I was at Homestead, Florida for a while, uh, there we only went to, uh, went to Turkey and back. Okay, you were talking about Turkey, now was there an actual base there or did you live on the economy? Uh, no, there was an actual base there. Uh, we had, uh, it, it was actually a Turkey's base, but uh, Excuse me, we, we had our, our squadrons there and they, uh, uh, we basically had the base ourselves, but there was a Turkish presence there. But it was, it was there and we were mainly uh, in supporting the, the nuclear war at that time, the Cold War effort. You re what kind of, do you remember what the targets were? What kind of targets, I should say? Uh, it's, it's a little fuzzy there. I don't remember specifically. I think most of them were either uh, uh, military uh, or we thought they were doing military targets, of, uh, whether it was weapons that they were building or tanks or that type of thing. I think there were some airfields that we had targeted, uh, as best in my recollection. And the targets I recall, and you know, we we flew in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland. Those were the areas, and I've right. from coming up from Turkey, we're probably into. Uh, I think so. Uh, of course, we we also sent nuclear alert when we were in Aviano, Italy, and then we were back uh, home in Homestead, Florida, when, when I was over there later. But uh, the first time I was over there was just TDY when I was from Homestead. So uh, what do they call the alert? Uh, I call it a Victor Alert. Yeah, All right. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, we we set you know the airplanes were cocked and ready to go and. Uh, we had facilities there where we had four lines, so four of us were on alert, uh, usually three-day three, three day shifts, we'd rotate every three days. Yeah, yeah, we did the same thing. So, how long were you in Turkey then? Well, we were supposed to be there about three months, but uh, as, as things happened at that time, uh, the Vietnam War started heating up, and uh, one of the first squadrons to go over there was the 307th, uh, which was out of, uh, back at Homestead. So, instead of replacing us in Turkey, they went to Vietnam. <laughs> So uh, our 306 squadron ended up being over there, I think, close to five or six months before they finally got a squadron replaces over so there. So what year would that be? Uh, that would be uh, in uh, late 64. I was there from, I think, uh, May of 64 to like October 64. And uh, then did you go direct to Vietnam then? Uh, then I came back to Homestead. I uh, actually had a short stint going to something called uh, officer, Squadron Officer School up at Maxwell. Uh, and then uh, I came back and uh, they were sending a lot of people to TDY to Vietnam at that time, but uh, then they came down and decided uh, it was time to send people actually PCFs, permanent change of station. So I received an assignment to go to Karat, Thailand. Uh, I went over there in October of 60, uh, excuse me, October 65. Uh, and even though I had F-100 experience, uh, I, they signed me to the command post, which uh, was okay at that time. I, uh, so obviously it was not a, a flying assignment, but uh, 
Uh, I was a first lieutenant at that time. I worked in a command post in Karat. I was there for a year, uh, and this was during the time of Rolling Thunder. And, so uh, what, that, year was, what year would that be? Uh, well, that started in uh, 60, 60, 65, uh, 65 to 66. Is, uh, uh, I was there just for a year. So, of course, Rolling Thunder started that time and continued on after I was gone. But uh, again, that's when we had the F-4s, the 105s uh, flying out of uh, both Karat uh, and Takli into North Vietnam. and. Uh, they also, an uh, interesting thing related to the F-100 is uh, they had the first wild weasel uh, program. They had six F-100Fs that were modified to go after the, uh, uh, the SAM sites over there. They developed a strike missile, which would actually, uh, the idea was to hone in on the, uh, the radar uh, signal from the uh, SAM sites and then destroy them that way. So, Who's in the back seat there? Uh, they had the uh, weapon system officers, uh, so it was a, or electronic warfare officers. They had a, a special group, I think uh, Gary Willard was the head of the group. They brought to six airplanes over to, to Karat. and had to be there in the time I was there. Uh, but of course I couldn't fly with them because even though I had flown the F-100, these guys had very special training uh, down to Eglin. Uh, they had a pilot in the front seat, obviously, and an electronic warfare officer in the back seat to control the raw equipment uh, that was installed in the F-100Fs. Where were they flying out of? They were flying out of Karat, uh, and uh, they would escort, uh, they would be the lead aircraft, or they would lead a flight of, uh, of four F-105s uh, into North Vietnam, and uh, then they would try to seek out any of the SAM sites, destroy the SAM sites, and then the F-100s could go ahead and, and bomb their targets. So since you were working in the command post, were you getting the feedback about how well these things were working? Uh, yes, we, were, we certainly were. Uh, we, we basically uh, controlled, we got the, uh, the frag orders out of Saigon every day for the missions that the 105s, F-4s were going to fly in North Vietnam and, and the Wild Reason ones uh, were also there. And uh, so we certainly got immediate feedback on how the missions went that day, we reported that back to Saigon. Uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of a lot of one of fives uh, that were lost during that time period over there because uh, uh, there was a very heavy uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, threat in North Vietnam, and of course the SA-2s came in at that time, and of course the Mings were there also. So it was a, a very tough environment to fly in. Did the uh, F-100s ever engage any Mings? Do you know? Uh, the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, the F-100s uh, were only deployed in South Vietnam, so there was hardly ever, hardly ever any uh, uh, engagements with MiGs. The MiGs pretty much stayed in North Vietnam and only engaged the 105s and F-4s. Uh, there's one case I know that uh, they told uh, Captain Kilness, I believe was his name, uh, that did claim that he did, because uh, the F-100s F did go into the southern part of North Vietnam, uh, during the early part of the war, and so uh, there was one case where uh, he, uh, he did think he, it was a, it was never substantiated, but he did think he shot down an a, a MiG-17. But that's the only uh, <coughs> possible MiG engagement I'm aware of as far as the F-100. All the other engagements with the MiGs or certainly with the F-4s and F-105s. Yeah, one of the commanders I had shot down a MiG with a 105. He said he pulled off the target and the guns were armed and it was right there. He pulled the trigger and it blew up. Just, yeah, right. just a matter of a miracle, you know. But basically, even though I, my assignments, uh, I never did actually fly the F-100 in combat myself. I knew many guys that did, though, but uh, the F-100 was pretty much exclusively used in uh, South Vietnam, uh, dropping uh, napalm bombs, guns, and, uh, and that type of thing for close-air support. And I guess the timing, the way it worked out, uh, so I spent a year working in the command post at Karat. Uh, then when I finished that, I asked for an assignment to uh, back to the F-100. So I had a concurrent assignment to Lake and East England at that time. So uh, I was really out of country for four years, a year in, in Karat, and then I was in Lake and East England, uh, the 40th Attack Fighter Wing. Uh, I was assigned to the 493rd Attack Fighter Squadron, again there from October 66 to October of 69. So that's when I really did a, a lot of my best. Uh, F-100 flying, because there we had three squadrons. We had the uh, uh, 492nd, the 493rd, the 494th, and we basically rotated around. One squadron was always gone. We'd be gone a month at a time. We'd usually spend two weeks uh, down at uh, Wheelis for gunnery training, and then we'd spend the other two weeks either at uh, Aviano, Italy, 
or back to Izmir, Turkey, uh, or Chile, as we call the base. Well, one out of three isn't bad. Yeah. Aviano. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so for three years, that was basically what I did. We uh, we spent a lot of time TDY rotating between those bases. Uh, we had uh, we had a base. Uh, we did have a range in uh, in England where we could do some gunnery training, but it was with the weather and the conditions. It was it was. Uh, a lot more efficient to go down to Wheelis and do a lot of our serious gunner training down there. And there again we did both the conventional training and the nuke training since the F-100 did both roles during that time. What did you think of Wheelis? Oh, it was a cool place. Uh, I think uh, it was a good time to go down there. Uh, uh, it was a great place. The weather was always good and uh, you felt like you really got some good training and uh, good camaraderie. Uh, you met guys from other bases down there at the same time. So it was. It was a fun time down there. And a huge bar too. Oh yeah, big bar. <laughs> the bar was so big. It was nice incredible. beaches down there too. So it was. A good I do remember being there during the the, the six day war, uh, which took place for. Wait, I was there at the same time. Were you there? Okay, well, very good. So uh, I think we kind of sat down. We didn't really know what to do. I think we sat there for a couple of days. Uh, and an F-100 uh, kind of armed up, but we never know what was going to happen. And then I think we eventually uh, deployed back to back to Lake Eni. Yeah, we. I always used to get a kick out of the, you'd see the uh, Libyan Air Force fly around yes. and their T-Birds, you know, and I always just get a kick out of it because they never left the pattern. Yeah, they they'd just fly, right. <laughs> they fly around with the gear down all the time, you know. Just yeah, yeah I guess so. I, sure, I, I, thought that was, yeah. I thought that was really, really it's unusual. So. Yeah. And then my wife has a, uh, a recipe from Aviano that uh, I picked up at one of those uh, uh, restaurants that she makes every now and then. Yeah, we, we always had good eating and we were good to Aviano. It's a good, good Italian places to go, that's for sure. sure. A lot of good wine. That's for sure. <laughs> so, okay, so you were at Lake and Heath from when to when? Okay, so I was there from uh, 1966 to 1969, uh, just for exactly right three years. And then I came back to uh, uh, to the States and uh, I was actually, so there again, since my D-Rolls or time for overseas, uh, you know, I wasn't going to step back to, to Thailand. So that's another reason I never really got in that air war in Vietnam. But my next assignment was Reese Air Force Base, Lubbock, Texas. I was the, uh, assigned to the head of the little uh, test group, even though it was a pilot training base, but we had a little, small little test group that would fly the airplanes on test stops after they had maintenance for them before we turned them back over to the uh, to the students to fly. So I, I had a bit more time in the T-37 and T-38 during that time. And that was uh, 70, 69 to 71. Uh, my next assignment, uh, I applied to uh, AFID, which is Armed Forces Institute, Institute of Technology out of Wright Path. But they had programs at different schools around the country, so uh, I received an assignment to get an MBA degree at uh, SMU in Dallas, Texas. So it was pretty cool. Uh, it was just a one year program. Uh, uh, I think I graduated in uh, the end of 72, I think it was uh, October, let's see, at the end of the school year, I think it was April or May of 72, uh, but I'd been there just a year and I uh, got an MBA degree, uh, which was a, a, a good thing. So did you So did you stay 20 years in the Air Force then? Yeah, sure did. Uh, anyway, after I got the uh, I got my MBA degree, then it was time to go back to Vietnam again, uh, or Thailand, I should say, uh, the, the Vietnam War. Uh, I spent 22 years in the Air Force overall, so uh, after I had my MBA degree, then uh, it was, t was time to go back to uh, uh, Thailand. But instead of sending me again to back to the F-100 unit, uh, they sent me back to uh, uh, Udor in Thailand this time, and this was in 70, 72. Uh, I was there again for another year. It was a one-year assignment from 72. October 72 and October 73, uh, and that's when we were right during the end of the war. So I worked for something called 13th Advon, General Hughes was the head of our one star up the uh, Udorn. And uh, there again, uh, it was not a flying assignment for me, I was on his staff and we coordinated uh, a lot of the efforts uh, for the linebacker at that time, linebacker one, and then became a later linebacker two. So it was again an interesting assignment. I, I coordinated a lot of the uh, F-111s were flying out of Tagli at that time. Uh, we set up little remote uh, uh, battery uh, beacon systems in, in Laos for them to bomb off of. So if they would go into North Vietnam on their primary mission, uh, they couldn't find their target wherever they come back to Laos and uh, we always had backup targets for them there. 
We also coordinate a lot of the gunships, uh, the A-130s and also the C-47s uh, for a lot of the, the road traffic on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, a lot of the truck traffic. Uh, so it was a, an interesting time and of course uh, there was there during the end of the war when uh, Nixon finally authorized the use of uh, the B-52s in the linebacker two effort uh, that did eventually bring the end to the war. So uh, we coordinated uh, the end of war activities and then we still had aircraft there in, in Thailand and we didn't really know what to do when the war was over so we actually set up some training uh, places in, in Thailand so until everybody was withdrawn out of there I kind of coordinated some of the training bases they had in Thailand. So it was an interesting year, it had two different years and uh, supported the Vietnam War but both of them in Thailand. So what were they, so they were training people to fly the American airplanes that were left behind? No, we were still just maintaining our own people. We still had our own people there at Udorn and, and Kuna, uh before we withdrew all the airplanes and they just wanted to have some place to fly. So we, we set up a, a little training base, I can't remember the name of the base, but the Thailand did have a, uh, a gunnery range there that we could do, do some training flights in. And then shortly after that, shortly after I left, I know in September of 73 I believe it was, uh, you know, everybody was pretty well pulled out of there. Huh. That was a lot, a lot of money. It yeah, kind of it was. It was amazing. But the good news from my standpoint was I got back in the F-100 after that. Uh, after I left Udorn, uh, they assigned me to a 9th Air Force uh, IG team in Shaw Air Force Base in uh, South Carolina, right outside of Sumter, uh, a good base. And our mission there was to do little mini ORIs, if you will, uh, operational inspections of the, of the Guard and Reserve units. Uh, they had, uh, we basically covered the eastern part of the United States. Uh, Berkshire Air Force Base had a similar ORI team that did uh, uh, the Guard and Reserve units in the western part of the United States. But it was really cool. I got back, to, and the, the reason I, they assigned me there is because of my F-100 experience. And of course, um, all the F-100s were pretty much were the, the Guard and Reserve units at that time. So uh, I had a good buddy I went to pilot train with by the name of Ron Byers, uh, and he was the uh, DO at, uh, in, 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 I'll think about it in a minute here, uh, in Indiana, at, at Terre Haute, Terre Haute, Indiana, I'm sorry. Anyway, we, uh, I said I need to get current back in the F-100, so he said, sure, come on up. And so uh, I got to go know the guys there at Terre Haute real well and uh, flew with them quite a bit and then uh, for about uh, two and a half years uh, I did inspections of Guard and Reserve units, uh, primarily the ones that flew the F-100, I, I would fly with their guys and it was a great bunch of guys to fly, most of them were uh, airline pilot guys that were uh, in the Guard and Reserve and uh, so I, I got to fly uh, some of their, uh, we went to F-105 year guys uh, units also and, uh, and we had some of them also uh, I'm trying to remember what other planes. I think one of them had a T 37s, they flew, and some uh, O2s. But they're quite a mixture of airplanes, but uh, of course I enjoyed mostly flying with the F 100 units. So, for a, for a real offhand thought here, the maintenance of the active duty F 100s versus the Guard and Reserve F 100s, what would you think, how would you compare the two? Uh, good question. I, I guess I, I don't know of any uh, real difference. I, I think the Guard and Reserve units, you, know, you had a lot more stability in the Guard and Reserve I mean, those, those maintenance guys, uh, they worked there for the same airplane for, you know, many, many years. So I, I think in some respects, uh, even though the airplanes were older by the time they got to the Guard, uh, they were certainly well maintained and uh, uh, I don't ever remember how many problems with any of the airplanes I flew with the Guard and Reserve units. Uh, I was in the reserves for a long time, and okay. it was the one thirties in the reserves. And we had every time we'd go any place to support an active duty unit, we'd always be using our planes because they were broken. Yeah, <laughs> and you get in one of theirs, and they were dirty and grungy inside. Yeah. And ours were just pristine. And yeah, I think the guard guy took a great, a great pride in keeping their planes in good flying shape. And uh, well, they've been working on it for twenty odd years. Yeah, it's pretty I easy. think. My last flight, the F one hundred, uh, was in uh, June of nineteen seventy six. Uh, Jack Dobb, uh, who was the uh, air advisor at, uh, at Terre Haute, uh, flew me back to, from Terre Haute back to Shaw, and that was my last flight in the F-100, or my last flight back to, at all in the F-100. I never, I never did fly anymore after that. That was the only airplane ever really flew outside the T-37, T-38. Yeah, I was born in Terre Haute, actually. Really? Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs>
I remember driving by the base and seeing the F-100s there. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. They, they but, were, yeah, yeah, I hit it there. So. Yeah, it's the first time I've heard say, anybody say the word Terre Haute in a long time. Okay. <laughs> Two words, actually. <laughs> well, so, what do you know, what could, now the F-100, when you flew them, most of the time they had tanks on them. Was there a big performance difference between an F-100 with tanks and without tanks? Well, you're right. Uh, certainly our normal mm -hmm. configuration was a flight with the 335-gallon uh, uh, tanks, uh, mainly for, uh, you know, to give us a little more uh, effort to get, travel further. Uh, they also had the bigger ones called 4, 450, which were not very aerodynamic at all. We used those a few, a few times. Uh, when we fly from Lake and Eath all the way down to Wheelus, because it was a kind of touch and go whether we could make it to, without going into uh, Aviano on the way or not. But uh, but you're right, the 335 gallon tanks were the main ones uh, that they used most of the time. Uh, of course, flying the clean, flying the airplane cleaner was a, a lot more maneuverable, and but of course a lot shorter range. So, what do you think would be the comparison between a clean T30, a well, a 38 T38, and an F100 clean? I, I think fairly comparable there, certainly. Uh, I think the T-38 was actually even a little sleeker of an airplane and uh, uh, a little later design, certainly. So, you know, and then they used the T-38, I think, as one of the aggressor squadrons out of uh, Nellis there for red flag training later. So it was a, a good airplane to use from that standpoint. Yeah, still using them. Yeah, I guess they are. I was, we went for the 50th anniversary of graduating from pilot training last year. Cool. And they still had some flying. Right. They said there were 35 left out of a thousand that they'd started with. And of course, I you know the astronauts used the T-38 flying back and forth between uh, uh, Texas and uh, down oh, yeah. to uh, yeah, down Al, the Cape. Al Warden told me that they had uh, who was on Apollo 15. Right. He said anywhere you went, you always had a T-38 within an hour. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you want, if you'd make a call an hour later. Yeah. yeah. So you had a lot of nuclear alert. Sure did, yeah. You know, both in uh, you know, Lake and Eath and, and Terre Haute, excuse me, uh, Avion, Italy, and, and Turkey. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, was so, that was just so boring. Well, yeah. Actually, we uh, we actually had a little, we could actually go out and play golf at uh, Lake and Eath. We had a little nine hole course where we sat up right next to the, where our oh, work wow. facility was. Cool. So we could do that. And, and a lot of times uh, we could actually go on base. Uh, I, I think they relaxed the 15 minute alert uh, sometimes. So we could actually go on base and uh, go shopping or go to the movie. Yeah, the once wife you finally get the radios, time. we could walk yeah, around. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it, yeah. it, it gave us some flexibility. Sure. Have you ever gone back to Lake and Heath? Excuse me? Did you ever go back to Lake and Heath? Uh, no, I didn't. Not military. I did, uh, I, did go back, I did go back to England and visit uh, some friends I met over there, but I never did go back to uh, the military bases over there, no. Yeah, so you would fly, you were able to fly the T-37 and the T-38 at the same time just to do test hops. Right. Yeah. That must have been kind of fun. Yeah, it was. That was kind of a fun time. I can do four or five flights a day sometimes. You go up for about a half hour just to make sure everything's working okay, depending on whether there was an engine change or they did something to the wings or, or whatever. We'd usually uh, go through and uh, well, the T-38, well, the, T-38, we'd actually shut down an engine if it had been an engine change and then restart it in the air and that type of thing. Uh, but uh, it could fly just fine on one engine and uh, T-37 could too. But uh, it was it was kind of, I was fun flying, uh, just flying those airplanes. And uh, again, never really had any serious problems with any of them. I, I, when, one time, I think one of the T-38, the engine didn't, didn't relight, but again, no problem flying it on one engine, that's for sure. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed my my flying in the, in the military, the F one hundred and so forth. But uh, once I once I retired, I never I never did get back into flying. I just I've enjoyed aviation, and, uh, but I never did actually uh, pursue flying for ever anymore. Well, it's no fun when you have to pay to do it. That's true. That's, That's exactly <laughs> how I look at it. But besides, scenario you want to talk about? Uh, well, I just finished up my military career real quick. I had a couple of more good assignments. I went to Wright Patterson uh, uh, again. My MBA degree helped me out there. I uh, I got into. Uh, uh, the acquisition business uh, at Wright Patterson. I worked in the Electronic Warfare Program Office, and uh, we 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 coordinated or ran a lot of the programs for electronic warfare systems coming into the Air Force. So I spent there uh, uh, about four years until 1980, and then my last assignment was on the Air Force IG team out of Norton Air Force Base in San Bernardino. And again, a, a, a neat assignment. Uh, 
we think of the uh, Air Force IG as going out and doing ORIs and that type of thing, but we had a, a, a team that they called the uh, System Acquisition Management Inspection Teams. And we basically inspected new systems coming into the Air Force. Uh, what was the need? Uh, was it going to cost? Was it going to be cost effective? Did the Air Force really need it and that type of thing? Uh, a couple of them that I was involved in, one was called, uh, when we did on special operations, I know some of the new systems coming in, we went down to Eglin, went back to the Pentagon and discussing some of the new uh, special operations uh, systems that were coming into the Air Force. Another one was called Glickham and Ground Launch Cruise Missile, which were, uh, again, uh, was an uh, idea of a nuclear weapon uh, being launched from a, a back of a big, a big truck, basically, and uh, we were going to deploy this in Europe. Uh, we, we, we took trips over to uh, Belgium, I know, and to uh, Green and Common in England. Uh, again, that, that, that was canceled later, I think, by Reagan. But uh, again, it was an interesting uh, assignment, uh, the Air Force IG team. I was back in California, kind of back home again, so uh, it was a good time to retire after 22 years. Uh, I stayed back in California. I was able to get it a year. Uh, after a few months of uh, retirement life, I moved down to San Diego. I got a uh, position with uh, what used to be called L'Oreal at that time, later became L3 Communications. Uh, as a program manager, again, we, we worked on systems uh, related to telemetry uh, system, mostly for uh, satellites and uh, missiles and that type of thing. So a good, uh, a good another 20-year career uh, after my military career. But oh, wow. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. What does Temecula mean? Uh, it's an, I think it's derived from an Indian name. I think it has something to do with the the land of the morning mist or something like that, yeah. but it, it's kind of cool. I, uh, I grew up in that area. My brother uh, uh, about four and a half years older than I am though, but uh, retired in that area. Uh, the Barnett family actually has a lot of history there. Uh, my grandmother, Isabel Barnett, was uh, the first white woman born in Temecula Valley and uh, wow, cool. they, they later named a, a school, Isabel Barnett uh, Elementary School up here. So it's kind of neat to have a lot of uh, a lot of history in that area. and, and uh, one of the homes she grew up in has, a, has been preserved there as a historical home. In the, uh, it's actually a, a shopping center a little bit north of downtown Temecula, but uh, oh, wow. it's kind of neat to have that kind of history there. Yeah, it's hard to believe that you managed to escape going to uh, combat being a... It is. Uh, it, it, like I say, it was mainly because I had uh, was in Thailand for the year and then went straight to uh, uh, overseas for another three years. So, and of course that was 66 to 69 it was a really a a big part of the the war in South Vietnam that there, yeah, that's yeah. when a lot of guys, there were one of our guys over there. Yeah, Travis. Thing about uh, the F one hundred, I think has been kind of neat. Uh, uh, a guy by the name of Les Frazier in Texas started uh, uh, getting people together to clone the F one hundred. He called it the Super Saber Society. So rather than go ahead, rather than have. Uh, reunions of just a, a wing or a unit or a squadron or something like that. Uh, he set up a, a group of anybody that ever flew the up 100 and uh, I've heard anywhere from you know maybe you know 20 25,000 guys or for a 20 year period from the mid 50s to the late 70s maybe 25 year period. I mean a lot of guys flew the up 100. So he set up this group to get together with just anybody that ever flew the up 100. So in 2007 we had our first reunion in Las Vegas I think it was Gold Coast, Gold Coast uh, Hotel, mainly as a follow-on to the F-86 guys, because the F-86 guys had their reunion over there every couple of years, so we made it a follow-on to have the F-100 uh, at the same time. So it's been pretty cool. So uh, I think but I didn't just, they have a reunion at Elmendorf recently? Excuse me. Uh, not, not the F-100. Now they may have had a, a splinter group of some kind, but the whole were all super same group. <laughs> Well, you must have retired as lieutenant colonel. Right? Yeah, I retired as lieutenant colonel. Uh, I was up for 06, but never did quite make it, so it was a good time to retire out of the IT team. And uh, uh, it's been, anyway, the, uh, back to the Super Savory group. We get together every two years over in Las Vegas, and it's been really neat. Uh, uh, there's about five or six guys I flew with in Lake Heath, or I got to know real well, and uh, we've gotten together every couple of years over there and relived the times when we flew together. So uh, it, it's been a great time. Uh, we, we had one reunion at, uh, at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, I think in 2015, and that was really cool. Uh, they, they, they set it up for us right in the, 
in the museum, uh, right next to the F-100 they have there, in fact, and uh, under uh, the wings of a big B-52, but uh, otherwise we've had all of our reunions in, uh, in Las Vegas, but uh, it's been pretty cool. Uh, Bob Hoover uh, spoke to us several times, uh, uh, but they uh, spoke to us as part of our group. Uh, those two gentlemen, unfortunately, both passed away since then, uh, but I've had a chance to meet uh, a lot of neat guys that way. Uh, there are still two F-100s actually flyable these days, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, one of them, uh, the Collins Foundation down in Ellington in Texas, Ellington, Texas, <coughs> uh, they, they kept an airplane, the flyable, uh, uh, these are both two seat versions of the F-100F, uh, but it, would, it flew uh, the last, uh, in October of this last year at their uh, air show down there, the wings over Houston. And uh, I went down there, my wife and I went down there to visit them in, the, in May of last year. And then we got to see a fly this year, but uh, they maintained it down there. They dedicated it to uh, to Bud Day, who uh, led the first Misty Squadron uh, in North Vietnam, excuse me, in South Vietnam, uh, the the forward air control uh, squadron that uh, was developed over there. Again, they used just the F model airplane, where they could have a, a pilot both in the front seat and back seat, basically going out, uh, jinking, looking for any aircraft sites, and. Uh, to, to, to take those out. So you, you never you never worked with a forward air controller then, I guess? No, I never did. No, I never did. Uh, during my time, uh, yeah, I know in South Vietnam, of course, that's uh, the, they had O2s and O1s and O2s, and I think OV10s, and then the, uh, the F100s uh, with all the forward air controls. I know most all the guys that flew missions down there obviously flew uh, under the control of a forward air controller because they were close to troops in contact in a lot of cases, I uh, know. Hey, uh, a marine friend of mine who was on the ground in 68 and there for Tet, he said the airplane they always wanted to see up to help out was the F-100 because it was the most right. accurate. Right. So, but I guess going slowly. The other F-100 is still around, I got a main, is uh, in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, Cutter is his call sign, uh, Dean Cutter and uh, Cutshaw, I think it was his name. but. Uh, Anyway, he's maintained this airplane uh, for a good 20 years, and uh, he does it at air shows. Uh, uh, we. Where does he get the money for the gas? Jesus. Yeah, well, he he, he charges. He's invited uh, some of our uh, Super Saber guys to come back there and fly with him, and they only let us fly in the back seat. I have not done it myself, but several guys have. Uh, last year, I think about they took. Uh, we had a weekend up there in Fort Wayne. Uh, I think Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I think he flew 12 guys during that time, oh. at least two a day, uh, two or sometimes three a day. He'd take them up for about a half hour. But anyway, really pretty cool. And uh, he, he charges uh, $5,000 to do a flight, which seems like a lot, but uh, it's a neat experience for guys that want to get back and, uh, oh. and, and be in the airplane again. And it's the only one really flying uh, right now that I know of. I'll show you the one down in Ellington, but yeah. there are two, two airplanes still flyable. Yeah, you got the amount of fuel just you know, yep. you just keep <laughs> yeah, keeping parts, but he's got a couple of the good crew chiefs. I know they've worked for him many years there at Cutshaw, didn't they? Well, thank you, sir. That was great. Good stuff. Yeah, I appreciate it, Ron. I, it's been a good uh, career, and of course, I've uh, volunteered here at the uh, museum here for the, about over 10 years now, and uh, it's always good to keep up in aviation and uh, keep our hands in it. Uh, I'm the flight captain of our Dedangans group here now, and uh, uh, so uh, aviation has been a good thing. I've had a chance to meet some of the uh, the astronauts that have been here. Uh, you mentioned Al Warden. I, I met him one time. Uh, uh, let's see, I think uh, Gene Cernan I know was here one time. I mean, several years ago I had a chance to meet him. And, uh, well, we're running out of those guys. Char Charlie Duke. That was the one I met. I uh, escorted here last year and that was a really right. neat experience to do that. Uh, he was on the one of the one with a few ones that was on, actually landed on the moon. The other two, uh, the other two might help, but it just circled the moon. Cool magazine. Now uh, I'll let you look at it. It's, it. We put it uh, three times a year at the intake. We call it. It's uh, a Super Saber Society uh, uh, organization that started about over ten years ago, and they they really put some great articles in here about it. Anyway, it's kind of a friend that's.